Okay, so let's assume x is large and h is small relative to x. And uh, ask how many primes are in x to x plus h. Okay. So um, we saw an approximate, we, sorry, let me get this. Uh, we saw uh, uh, an explicit formula for psi of x. And this is a different version that's more useful in uh, when you have to actually use the explicit formula. So psi of x is x minus sum over the non-trivial zeros. Before we had an infinite sum. And that, of course, presents some problems. Uh, it turns out it's, it's not absolutely convergent. Uh, so a truncation is good, but then, you know, you have an error term. Okay, so this is a, a good way to actually use the explicit formula. <clears throat> and uh, if we want to study primes from x to x plus h, uh, we should just difference this at x and x plus h and see what we get. <clears throat> and I've written that here. Uh, the error terms, you get an error term with an x plus h and an x, but h is no bigger than x, so uh, those are the same uh, size. <clears throat> and now uh, uh, let's assume that the Riemann hypothesis is true, so that the question of the horizontal distribution is completely settled. Okay, then um, <clears throat> x is uh, in absolute value square root of x x plus h is no bigger than 2x, uh, so 2x to the square root of 2x. So you get an x to the half in every one of these terms times the sum 1 over the modulus of rho, and then this same error term. And remember, uh, n of t, the number of zeros in the critical strip up to high t, was t log t. Okay, so uh, what, what's that saying? That's saying, you know, in a, in a box, a big height up to, uh, of, uh, let's say, length one, but <clears throat> uh, there's log t zeros in that box at most. Okay, so uh, that means they're more dense uh, than just integers, say, and uh, it's a, actually, it would be a good, a good uh, little exercise, calculational exercise to use that fact to show that this sum is no bigger than log square t. If you were summing 1 over n for n less than or equal to t, you'd have log n here, but the rows are more dense by a factor of log, so you get the log square. Okay, so now we have this, and uh, if you balance these two, if you take t to be root x, <clears throat> you get this, okay? So uh, psi of x plus h minus psi of x is bounded by root x log square. Okay, now, <clears throat> this, uh, this difference counts not just primes with weight log p, right? Remember, psi of x was some lambda of n, n less than or equal to x. It's not only the primes counted with log p, but prime square, primes cube, and so on. But another simple exercise you could try is to show that the higher powers of the primes don't contribute much in this sum. So, uh, so just think of this as the sum log p for p between x and x plus h. And that's x, root x log square at most, assuming rh. Okay, so <clears throat> if there were no primes in x, x plus h, this side would be zero, apart from those powers of primes. And uh, that would say that h is no bigger than root x log square x, right? Here's h, this, this part is zero. So you can't have a gap, the, the, you can't have a, ba a gap bigger than square root of x log square x, assuming our h. Okay, well, what do we think we know? Uh, probabilistic arguments on the distribution of primes suggest that um, Probably the biggest gap you could ever see between two primes, consecutive primes up near x, is the square root of log square plus a little bit of x. While log square and square root of x are totally different sizes. So what we believe is true is this, and what we can prove, even assuming our h, is only this. So the Riemann hypothesis is not really telling us much, at least the way we've used it, um, about 
gaps between primes. Okay, so what's, what's wrong? Uh, we put absolute values around all the terms. Let me go back. Um, <clears throat> I put, whoop. <laughs> we put absolute values around these terms. If there's cancellation in those terms, you lose it at that point. So that's what we've lost. And, and um, how, how could you make use of cancellation if you knew enough about the zeros? Well, so, so if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then um, you know, you've got these terms with frequencies e to the i gamma log x, and you'd somehow want to see how they cancel. That gets into vertical distribution. That, and, and this shows you why vertical distribution might be uh, an important uh, issue. <clears throat> okay, so that's, you know, s let's, let's suppose the Riemann hypothesis is true. How are the zeros then distributed on the critical line? <clears throat> okay, yes. Okay, so this brings us to uh, Hugh Montgomery's paper in 1974, I believe it was, um, on pair correlation. Uh, and to my mind, uh, this, this paper, you know, just looking back historically, I think this paper was pivotal just as Riemann's was. Now, I'm not saying they're pivotal in the same way, um, you know, or necessarily the same degree. They're doing different kinds of things. but. Uh, to my mind, this is, this is a pivotal paper in the, in the subject. Uh, so, <clears throat> in uh, 1972, Montgomery actually gave a conjecture for how the zeros are distributed on the critical line. And this is what his conjecture looks like. It's called the pair correlation conjecture. So, uh, it's, it's a little strange and uh, um, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, pairs of zeros of ordinates. So this assumes RH, and then you look at pairs of zeros, you look at their difference, you want to know how those differences are distributed. So the physicists probably all uh, know about this sort of thing with eigenvalues, and you'll see a lot about this later in the week. Um, so the average gap between ordinates is 2 pi over log t. That comes from that n of t formula, t over 2 pi log t. <clears throat> and if the zeros were just uniformly distributed on that scale, uh, then the right-hand side here would be the integral from alpha to beta, if you, if you want to count uh, differences between alpha times the average uh, to beta times the average, you'd just integrate 1 times t over 2 pi log t. But you're subtracting something here. Now, if you think of alpha and beta as uh, both small, close to zero, then the sine pi x over pi x is close to one, so the integrand here is close to zero. So that means that um, uh, differences that are small um, and, you know, uh, so, are, are less frequent than, you know, when they're not small, okay? When, once alpha and beta are bigger, uh, this quantity is much less than one, and so you get something closer to one in the integrand, okay? So there's kind of repulsion of zeros. That's what it's saying. <clears throat> okay, and uh, uh, somewhere around 19, late, the late 70s, early 80s, Andrew Odlisko did a lot of calculations to see if this conjecture was correct, and the evidence was, was really extraordinary, extraordinarily good. Okay, the same year, this is a famous story, uh, Montgomery um, mentioned this result to Freeman Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and Dyson recognized this distribution law for differences in pairs of ordinates as the same one that occurs in random matrix theory for the Gaussian unitary ensemble, which you'll hear more about later. And um, <clears throat> uh, Dyson told him that there's, you know, the distribution for these random matrix uh, eigenvalues 
was known for not just pair correlation, but n-level correlation, where you take you know, n of these things in difference. Um, and uh, so Montgomery conjectured that the distribution of you know, n-tuples of zeros should be the same way as for random matrix theory. And this is called the GUE hypothesis. <clears throat> um, and then over the next 25 years, uh, there was a lot of work, both theoretical and empirical, uh, checking uh, about this conjecture. Uh, here are some of the names of people who were uh, important in this area. Uh, De uh, Dennis Hedgehog calculated a, a triple correlation on the number theory side. Uh, Rudnick and Sarnak did n-level correlation. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's Katz and Sarnak, uh, John Keating and Bogomolny did some really nice work on n-level uh, um, correlation, Steve Miller, many, many others. I've left plenty of names off here. <coughs> um, and, and not only was there a lot of confirmation of this GUE hypothesis, but uh, there were applications worked out. Um, so, for instance, gaps between primes or, or primes in short intervals. Um, um, a number of people uh, looked into that and used, uh, deduced the implications of pair correlation and so on for that. Uh, and some of that work is still going on. Um, <clears throat> so, there's some people who did that. And then, um, the next bit, really big breakthrough, I, I'd say, was by John Keating and Nina Snaith, who took this to another level. I mean, there, there's other work too, and I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not intentionally, uh, you know, trying to slight anyone. It's just there's been a lot of work, but uh, a really pivotal thing was when Keating and Snaith uh, had the idea of modeling the zeta function itself by the characteristic polynomials of random matrices from uh, GUE or CUE. So uh, let me, here's my idea, John can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think the basic idea was, um, uh, uh, you know, pick a, uh, an interval between T and 2T, zeta is continuous, it's analytic and all that, uh, so it's well approximable by polynomials. Well, uh, how about if you use polynomials that have uh, zeros that are like the zeros of the zeta function? Okay, what does like mean? Well, uh, uh, suppose you take windows up the critical line and you look at the zeros of zeta, then maybe since the zeros are distributed like GUE, seem to be, GUE uh, um, uh, random matrices, maybe, uh, when you, if you average various quantities, like powers of the, of the characteristic polynomial <clears throat> um, over such windows going up the line, maybe that's like averaging characteristic polynomials uh, over the, um, uh, the group, like in the case of the circular unitary ensemble, which has the same statistics as GUE. <clears throat> maybe you get something similar. So. Um, uh, and they, they, that was the idea, uh, and they took matrices that had size about log t because those characteristic polynomials of matrices like this there, there's, have n zero, n eigenvalues, and uh, you know you want those correspond to the zeros, so you want about log t uh, zeros to get a good approximation. I'm skipping over some of the. Some of this because John maybe is going to speak about it. Um, so, if you compute a moment of a characteristic polynomial in an appropriate ensemble, um, then uh, a moment with respect to har, the Haar measure on, say, CUE, then maybe that will be like the moment of the zeta function on the critical line. Okay. And, um, Okay, so um, they used the uh, circular unitary ensemble, and uh, they computed this, they got this moment that it looks like this, 
Now, uh, the conjectural moment for the zeta function on the half line, 2 kth moment, looks like this. So, uh, if you take n to be about log t, uh, these terms match. This arithmetical factor in the zeta function, well, you don't really expect it to be here. There's these, uh, these characteristic polynomials don't see prime numbers. Um, and uh, then you get this factor left. So, maybe this and this should agree. Okay, so that was their hope, and uh, it turned out that when they did the calculation, came up with that conjecture, and I, I, that was just a statement of the conjecture when k is an integer, but they did it for uh, real k. <clears throat> um, so what they found was that uh, the, the G1 that, the, the, um, you know, we know is 1, and the G2 that's 2 from the second and fourth moments due to, um, uh, Hardy, Littlewood, and Ingham, uh, their factor in parentheses came out to agree with that. And um, uh, in 95, uh, Connery and, and Omit Ghosh had, had conjectured G3 is 42. Their factor agreed with that. And in the late 90s, uh, Brian and I conjectured this for G4, and their factor agreed with that. So I think that was quite compelling evidence that uh, they had this right, and uh, they were able to compute the, all the real moments for k bigger than minus a half. That's not minus a half factorial, that's minus a half, wow. k bigger, all of them, wow. Okay, so uh, I, I just want to, you know, sketch some of the, uh, you know, developments. Um, um, one of the major things that Montgomery's GUE conjecture and, you know, Keating Snaith and other people's uh, work has done is it's allowed us to conjecture very precise answers to questions that many of us previously thought we would never know the answers to in our lifetime. Um, so now, th there aren't uh, generally proofs, but um, as Brian once remarked to me, Brian Connery, you know, when you know the terrain of, you know, what the answer should be, it becomes a lot easier to, to see, you know, what to do in some cases anyways. <clears throat> and that's proved true. Um, so now, in light of GUE, pair correlation, um, let's look at some of the consequences to some of these problems I discussed in the first talk. Like, what about the order problem? Okay, so the moment problem, um, um, wait, let me just, uh, lost track, I got excited. Okay, so we were talking about the moment problem there. Okay, so what about the order of zeta of s? Um, so, <clears throat> um, on the critical line, remember, uh, that on RH, there's an upper bound for log zeta that looks like this, and then square root of that seems to be the size that you attain infinitely often for the lower bound. Okay, and we didn't know whether it's the square root or uh, the first power that's closer to the truth. And we still don't. Okay, it's a big, important problem. Um, using a hybrid formula for the zeta function, meaning, uh, you know, there's a product for the zeta function or c function over the, over the zeros of the zeta function and uh, an Euler product over the prime. There's a combined formula that was uh, proved by uh, John Keating, uh, Chris Hughes, and myself. And um, then using that and random matrix modeling, uh, David Farmer, Chris Hughes, and I uh, conjectured that the limp soup of the log of the zeta function on the half line divided by square root of log t log log t is square root of a half. So initially, there are other ways to do this now, but initially random, the, the GUE uh, uh, approach uh, allowed us to make this conjecture, uh, so, which is surprisingly precise. Um, <clears throat> the, this is different from the lower bound. The lower bound uh, that I had on the previous slide was log t divided by log log t. So that term is a little different, but basically, if this is correct, then uh, log 
mod zeta is like square root of log t rather than log t. But, um, you know, people have different views about this. Um, and remember that on the one line there was this factor of two that we uh, spoke about in, <coughs> you know, in, in this, uh, the upper and lower estimates. Um, if, if this result is correct, it would say that the one here is the correct constant, that this actually, this limb soup equals e to the gamma. Okay, so those two problems are really intimately connected. Okay, so, um, you know, since the rise of random matrix theory and its entrance into analytic number theory, we can make surprisingly good conjectures <coughs> about uh, problems that uh, we really believed were intractable and uh, just a few years ago. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's led to, to uh, other ways to make conjectures. See, once we've known the answers, you could figure out other, like, number theoretical ways to, uh, to come up with things. And so, for instance, two such things are uh, Connery, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith found a way to conjecture all the lower order terms, the asymptotic terms that uh, you were asking about earlier, um, they know how to do this now, and the guidance of random matrix theory and how answers should look uh, led them to this, although it doesn't use random matrix theory. <clears throat> um, uh, another great example is uh, something called the ratios conjecture. So both of these things are th things that uh, Brian and or uh, John will speak about. The ratios conjecture of Conry Farmer and Zirn, Zirn, Zim, Zernbauer uh, allows you to make conjectures about really complicated moments, for example, of things. And, uh, you know, when I remember what we knew and didn't know back in uh, when I was a graduate student and just starting off, um, I mean, to be able to come up with answers for all kinds of questions uh, is just, it's just a remarkable development. It's really uh, amazing how things have developed in the last uh, 40 years. Okay, so that's my last slide there, and I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> So I, I wanted to, I have to give you a little more substance, you know, and show you how some arguments go. And I, uh, I'm going to do at least two. I've got, uh, uh, there are three things I can prove here, but depending on time, um, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> I'll do at least two. Okay, so I think it's important to see a proof of the functional equation, okay? You, you can't think about the zeta function without knowing the functional equation and, um, and other L functions. So <clears throat> here's a reminder. Uh, so xi is defined as one-half s times, whoops, it's s minus one. <laughs> okay, that's a typo. Pi to the minus s over two, gamma of s over two, zeta of s. Okay, so that that's that's C of S, and the functional equation uh, for C can be written like this. C of S is C of 1 minus S. Okay, now the, the C function has the same non-trivial zeros, so those are the important ones, that uh, zeta has. Okay, the trivial zeros of zeta at negative 2, negative 4, and so on are canceled by, those were simple zeros, and they're canceled by the simple poles of the gamma fact, factor at those points. Okay, so that's why there's, so C doesn't have zeros at those points. Just inside the critical strip, they're the same. Also, C, C was entire because the S minus 1 that's supposed to be here cancels the pole of zeta at 1. And uh, this other factor of S is there to symmetrize things, S, 1 minus S. And the half is just sometimes useful to put in. So there's a, it doesn't have to be there, but 
<clears throat> okay, so uh, there's a lot, if you look in Tishmarsh's book, uh, there's, I don't know, at least half a dozen, maybe more proofs of this. Uh, two are by Riemann, and I'm going to show you one of the proofs. Uh, some of the proofs, well, the two proofs by Riemann are good for different things if you want to uh, develop the subject, but I won't get into that. Um, <clears throat> one of the proofs uh, depends on the functional equation for another function, the uh, theta function. Uh, this is one of many theta functions. It's a half integral modular form when you look at it as a function of a complex variable on the upper half plane. Okay, so it's this very quickly convergent infinite series. And the functional equation for it says theta of 1 over x is root x times theta of x. So the values of theta for x less than 1 are related to the values for x bigger than 1. Okay, and uh, the proof of this goes by Poisson's summation formula. I, I imagine that uh, physics people know Poisson's summation very well, so I'm not going to prove it. I'll just uh, remind you uh, at least one version. Uh, so uh, you can ignore these technical issues, but if you have a, uh, 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 a function, let's say a real valued function that's uh, whose second, you know, first two derivatives are continuous on the real line. You have a, a bound on uh, the function uh, and its first two derivatives that looks like this, okay? Uh, you know, so that those are in L1. Then, uh, the four, and the Fourier transform is, I'll take as this. Then the Poisson summation formula says that when you sum the function over the integers, it's the same as summing uh, the Fourier transform over the integers. <coughs> Okay, so let's assume that and take as our function f uh, e to the minus pi x u square. This is a function of u. Okay, then um, the Fourier transform is not hard to work out. It looks like this. So um, the theta function defined as this sum is just the sum of f over the integers and therefore, it's equal to the sum of f hat over the integers, which is this. But this is just theta at 1 over x rather than x. Okay, so that's the proof of the theta function functional equation. Okay, and um, now how, how do we use this? <clears throat> um, we start with the definition of the gamma function at s over 2. It's, this should be familiar to everybody. Looks like this. And I'm going to take s to be, the real part of s to be bigger than 1, so you don't have uh, any convergence problems. Um, and then you let u be pi x n square. Make that substitution, and you get uh, this expression for gamma of s over 2. And now divide both sides by pi to the s over 2 n to the s. And you get this. Okay, and now uh, sum over n. Okay, now you can do that. The uh, resulting sum is absolutely convergent, right? Uh, so when you sum this to the right of 1, uh, you're good. Okay, so you do that. And on the left, you get pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, zeta of s. On the right, you get this. Now here, I've, I've done something you always have to check. Uh, namely, I, I'm summing over n, so, and here you see the sum inside, so I've switched. But remember, this thing is so uh, quickly convergent in n that uh, you justify it by absolute convergence. <clears throat> okay, so you do that, and uh, this is what we just saw. <clears throat> and I'm going to call that sum omega of x. Now, uh, the theta function was this sum from minus infinity to infinity. So this is roughly half of that, okay? All right, so now uh, split the sum. Remember the theta function, we, we should expect omega to be related to theta, uh, um, and uh, theta, we could relate values for x less than 1 and bigger than 1 by the functional equation. So let's split this, the integral from 0 to infinity to two pieces, into two, two pieces, 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity. And in the first integral, we 
you know, with the functional equation for theta in mind, we replace x by 1 over x. You get this. <clears throat> okay, and this is the same thing again. And now um, we note from the definition of theta that omega is theta minus 1. So that's the n equals 0 term in here is 1, for, and that should be in theta. So we subtract it off. And then the negative integers and the positive integers for, for uh, this function uh, give you the same value. So you divide by 2. So this is the relation between omega and theta. And now, uh, so how does the functional equation for theta translate into one for omega? Well, we have this. And um, put in, you know, that this is root x theta of x. Then um, just take off and add terms so that I have a theta of x minus 1 over 2 here rather than, times root x rather than this because I want to, I want an omega of x back, okay? All right, so you take those two terms, put them <clears throat> in the first uh, integral for omega of 1 over x, and the result, um, well, here's a simplification, okay? Now, um, the result is that in this expression we had before, we can now write uh, this. This is what we saw at the bottom of the last slide. This integral is just that integral repeated. And uh, now I'm, I split off this term. And notice there's no special functions here, really. So uh, I just write that as an integral. We can calculate this by hand. And you get this. So this was all for real part of s bigger than 1. <clears throat> we have this plus these two terms. Now, I'm interested in the functional equation for c. So I have to multiply this by a half s times s minus 1. So you'll get a half s here. You'll get a half s minus 1 here. And then um, it looks like this. That's for a real part of s bigger than 1. Um, the series here is quickly convergent. And you appeal to basic theorem and complex variables that uh, if you have a nice, uh, nicely convergent uh, series um, that you integrate uh, and the terms are analytic, then the result is an analytic function. So um, that is the case here. It applies. And so that gives you um, an analytic, if you take any strip of the complex plane, uh, this is, omega is so quickly convergent as a seri the series for it, that um, this represents a holomorphic function in any strip that you uh, look at. And, um, okay, so now that gives you an analytic continuation of C to the whole complex plane. Okay, and then if you just replace s by uh, 1 minus s here, you get back the same thing. And so that gives you the functional equation. Okay, so that's, that's one of Riemann's two <coughs> proofs. <coughs> okay. Um, Okay, now this is something I've said before that you, the, that, um, okay, let's skip that. Um, and just uh, to remind you of something I said earl earlier today, uh, remember that the functional equation looks like this. This is without the half s, s minus 1. Uh, thus, <clears throat> um, if, you, if you divide by the gamma factor stuff, you get an expression for zeta and zeta 1 minus s that looks like this, and this factor, which you'll see again, is chi of s. Okay. All right. So now I want to um, prove the von Mengel zero-counting formula. 
And some of the ideas uh, that um, you'll see here and some of the other things I do will be repeated so, or, or mentioned again. They're, they're, they come up a lot, so it's partly uh, why I've, I've chosen to do um, some of these proofs. Okay, so a reminder, the formula we're talking about is that if you look at the zeros of the zeta function in the critical strip up to height t, from the real axis up to height t, then their number is given by this relatively precise formula. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's give a proof of this. Um, we're going to work with c instead of zeta. Remember, they have the same zeros, so uh, you can do that. And we take a, a, a rectangle, c, uh, with vertices 2, 2 plus i t, half plus i t, uh, or sorry, minus 1 plus i t. So let, me, let me draw this. Um, So this rectangle has the half line, um, you know, is symmetric about the half line. Here's the real axis. <clears throat> okay, so here's 2, 2 plus i t, um, a half plus i t, minus 1 plus i t, minus 1. We want to go this way around the rectangle. Okay, so if we count the number of zeros of the zeta or c function in that rectangle, uh, we're counting the zeros in the critical strip. Now, I'm going to ignore one uh, really a small uh, problem. There's a pole at 1 here, and that's supposed to get counted with a certain way. Just ignore that. It's not important. Okay, so then with... Uh, that caveat, 2 pi, so this is the argument principle, 2 pi times the number of zeros of uh, C in this rectangle is the change in the argument of C around the rectangle. Okay, now the critical strip, remember, is, is about here. Uh, to here. But zeta and c have no zeros here or here. Okay? Remember, the trivial zeros of zeta are not zeros of c, and even if they were, uh, the first one would be at negative 2. So uh, we're counting exactly the zeros we want. Okay, so what's the change in argument of c around this rectangle? <clears throat> Okay, and we want to make sure there's no zero on the rectangle, uh, and that's not a problem. Um, so, on the base of the rectangle here, the C function is real. Okay, the zeta function is real there, the gamma function, and so on. So it's real, so the there is no change in argument. Okay, uh, there's also no zeros there. Well, there is this... This is where this, the pole comes in. But, uh, so ignore that. This is, I haven't told you quite the truth here. Okay, now uh, I'm going to split this, the rest of the rectangle. So we can ignore this piece for now. And we go, <coughs> um, so this part from a half plus i t over and then down, that's L for left. And then this part, but going this way, is, is R. OK, so um, by the functional equation, if we know the argument on, of C on one, or the change in argument, we know it on the other. Um, let's take a look at that. So <clears throat> why is that? Um, uh, suppose I look at C along L. The, cha the change in argument of C along here, okay, well, uh, by the functional equation, C looks like this, which I can write like this, because C is real on the real axis. <clears throat> um, because this is a conjugate, this is saying that the change in argument here will be minus the change in argument of 
this expression under the conjugate. What does C of 1 minus sigma plus i t do? If, if sig, sigma plus i t is doing this, uh, 1 minus sigma uh, uh, plus i t is doing this. Okay? And uh, so minus this change in argument is the same as the change in argument of this. But that's the change in argument of C along the right edge to begin with. So that, in other words, <clears throat> because of the functional equation and the fact that C is real on the real axis, uh, the change in argument of C along here is equal to the change in argument here. So I just have to calculate one of those and multiply by two. Okay. So instead of 2 pi times the, ch uh, the number of zeros, I take pi times the number of zeros and just compute change in argument along the right half of our rectangle. Uh, okay, so um, this isn't too, too difficult. Uh, if, so C of S looks like this. That's its definition. Um, I'm going to start by taking the half S and combining it with the gamma function. Remember that gamma of z times z is gamma of z plus 1. So, um, that, uh, so I get rid of the half s and it becomes gamma of half s plus 1 there. Okay. And then uh, I want the change in argument of c C is a product of terms, so I have to add the changes in arguments of the individual pieces. Okay, so <clears throat> the change in argument of the first one, S minus 1, is, well, <clears throat> when I start off at S equals 2 over here, so I'm starting here, my argument is going to be 0. I'm going to start with the argument 0. I'm only interested in the change, so I can do that. And then I go along here by continuous variation. Uh, S minus 1 doesn't have any zeros or poles along that. So, so you see that the change in argument, oops, is just uh, the argument at the end point. Right? Went from 0 to whatever the argument is here. And that argument, uh, that argument is pi over 2 roughly, plus big O of 1 over t. So, see, if, if we were here, the argument would be exactly pi over 2, but it's off by a little bit. Okay, so that term was easy. <clears throat> now, what about the pi to the minus s over 2? Well, uh, split that up. I mean, there's many ways you can do it. And then pi to the minus sigma isn't changing, you know, so uh, the change in argument is the sum of the changes of these two arguments of these, these two factors. The change in argument of this is zero. Change in argument of this is, well, again, when we start here with t zero, we, the, our, we'll take as the argument zero. And then we go up. And again, it's the argument of e at the end point, e to the minus i capital T log pi over two. Okay, very exact. <coughs> Okay, for the arg change in argument of the gamma function, we use Stirling's formula. Looks like this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so th that would be a nice exercise if you are able to write it down. Uh, show that <clears throat> if this is log gamma of s, what's the change in argument of gamma of s over 2 plus 1? on this rectangle, okay? And so it's not very difficult because everything is explicit. Uh, just a little algebra and you get this. You can see the t log t from, you know, the s log s. All right. So now um, there's one other term we haven't looked at yet. There's also the change in argument of zeta on the right side of the rectangle. Okay, so let's talk about that in a minute. But in the meantime, <clears throat> the change in argument of C along R 
is going to be the sum of these changes of arguments of these pieces. So add them all up and divide by pi, right? Pi n of t was the change in argument along r. And you get this, where s of t, s of t um, is the zeta function change in argument, divided by pi, okay? Because we have to, we take the change in argument and divide by pi to get n of t, okay? So this is what we have so far. And uh, you see that's essentially the von Mengold formula, okay? But we still have to figure out what s of t is. Okay, we need a bound for that. And um, this is the more complicated part of the argument. And uh, the best bound we know unconditionally is that it's less and less than log t. <laughs> okay, I showed you earlier that um, if you know the Riemann hypothesis, the best bound we know is log t over log log t. So only a slight improvement on RH. But I that the log yes. Um, sometimes, right, it's peculiar. You can ignore the 7 8 and I didn't state it like this, but sometimes you're, you do things with s of t, like, like for instance, you want to know what the integral is then you, you want to, you know, that's going to contribute a, up to high t, 7 eighths t, so you want to keep track of things. But j for our purposes, you don't need to know that. I mean, you can throw it into the big O of log t. Okay, so now we want the change in argument of the zeta function on r. <clears throat> okay, let me... Uh, uh, In the northern hemisphere, these are black. Usually. Now, um, <clears throat> this is R again, and we want the change in argument of zeta. Now, we'll start with a, a value of argument equal to zero. Remember, zeta is real on the, uh, it's, it's also positive on, uh, at two. So we'll, we'll assume we're starting at a value zero, and then we watch the argument change continuously as we go along here. There's nothing to interrupt the continuity. There's no zeros of zeta or pole on R. <laughs> okay, so first let's, uh, let's see what happens from 2 up to 2 plus i t. Um, <clears throat> so the real part of zeta uh, is, so just put in the uh, Dirichlet series, and it's the sum 1 over n to the 2 plus i t. The first term is, in that sum is 1. All the other terms, if you take absolute values of them, is, uh, uh, gives you n to the minus 2. So the smallest the real part can be is the first term minus the modulus of the rest, okay? And if you calculate that, that's another uh, simple exercise. You can see that without much trouble that it's bigger than 0, just from elementary calculus. So. That means that uh, the real part of the zeta function is positive on this line. So if you think about the zeta function, you know, it's wiggling around in the complex plane, but its real part is positive. So here's the origin. Here's, this is the image plane. So as we go along, um, <clears throat> uh, the real part starts off, um, you know, with some value, and, and it stays to the right here. So the biggest the change in argument could be is pi over 2, because it's, it's staying, uh, oops, uh, wait, what have I got here? Uh, yeah, uh, um, it, it ends up either here, could, could end up there, but it's 
pi over two at most in, in change. change. Okay, so while that takes care of a big part of the contour, now we have <coughs> what's left and that's where all the trouble is. Um, so the way we figure out, th there's different approaches to this. Uh, I'm going to show you um, one. Um, <coughs> Suppose you look at the real part of zeta again along here. And I'm xing out places where the real part might be zero. Okay, now there's only going to be a finite number of these. Let's, let's call it k. So here I've drawn <coughs> k equals three places where the real part of zeta is zero. That splits the top edge into four, k plus one um, subintervals. And on each of those, um, you know, the real part of zeta is a continuous function here. So on each of those, um, if, since the real part of zeta can only vanish at these points, the real part is either positive or negative on this one, this one, this one. It can only change at those, cross, at those crosses. So uh, <coughs> um, if it's always positive here, then the change can be at most pi. Uh, if it's always negative here, the change here can be at most pi. Okay, so this gives us a way to track the change in argument. The argument can't change by more than pi on each of these k plus one intervals. <clears throat> so the change in argument along the whole right side is that change, pi times k, plus uh, whatever change we had here, and that was at most pi over two. So that, that gives k, uh, pi times k plus three halves. <clears throat> okay, now, um, so k is the number of zeros of the real part of zeta here, but uh, the real part of zeta can be written as an analytic function, namely, um, one half zeta of z plus i t plus zeta of z minus i t. Okay, so that's that gives you the real part of zeta of z plus i t. And if z is <clears throat> between one half and uh, two, now let's change the axis. This is the x axis. This is the y. Imaginary axis, okay, z is x plus i, y. Okay, so um, if I focus on the interval half to two, then, uh, and that, that's my z, then um, um, that's the real part of zeta, the same as the real part of zeta on this interval. Okay, and those are zeros of an analytic function, right? So, so I've got these points corresponding to zeros of f on this interval. Okay, well, let's take a slightly larger disk centered at two. Let's say its radius is r. Okay, and let's say that f, um, f of z has n zeros in, uh, I'm probably not supposed to do that. F has n zeros in uh, the disk z minus two, modulus of z minus two is less than r. Okay, then <clears throat> k, the number of zeros on here is less than or equal to that number because they're counted. Uh, they're already counted among them. Okay, so <clears throat> um, so uh, let's see. Okay, I, I drew the wrong disk here. I want a disk of 
that goes out to a half. Okay, and then <coughs> the number of zeros of f in that disk, n, is bigger than or equal to k, which is what I'm interested in. Okay, so now we use Jensen's formula, Jensen's theorem. Um, I'll take a disk of slightly larger radius. So this is the R, okay, and apply Jensen's uh, formula to that. Now, I stated it before as a disk centered at the origin. This is what it would look like if the disk is centered at two, and R is the radius. So we get log of the radius to the n, n is the number of zeros inside the disk of radius r, uh, um, divided by the product of the moduli of the distances of the, the roots to the, to the center. <coughs> and that's equal to uh, the integral of this, of log f around the bigger disk. Okay, on the left side, uh, what's the smallest these denominators can be? Excuse me. What's the smallest the denominators here can be? Well, Z1, the, the, the closest, uh, sorry, <laughs> what's the biggest? I want a lower bound for the left side. So what's the biggest uh, Z? <laughs> I'm trigger happy here. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, the z's um, let's see. Um, so what's the biggest z j minus two can be? Well, it's three halves, right? If it's as far away from the center as possible, and that uh, provides a lower bound for the left hand side. So. Um, log of r over 3 halves to the n is a lower bound for the left side. Log, what, what is f? f is just the zeta function up near height t. And uh, um, by what I said about the Mobius uh, function, the, uh, sorry, the Lindelof mu function, uh, the zeta function is no bigger than a power of t, small power of t. So um, the right-hand side is just log t. So from this, you get that n, the number of zeros inside the uh, disk, is at most log t. k was less than or equal to that. k was the number on the real segment. <clears throat> OK, so now we have that the change in argument, um, this should say, this should not say change in argument. It's a change in arg zeta along r, sorry for the typo. But anyways, uh, that is less than or equal to pi times k plus 3 halves. We saw that before. k is a less and less than n, less than or equal to n, and n is less and less than log t by this argument from Jensen's formula. Okay, so that means that s of t is less than less than log t. Okay, and now we get the Baumengold formula. Um, yes? Have I gone over? Yeah. I'm done. But let me just make one quick point. Well, that went fast for me. <laughs> um, uh, the basic point is that uh, whenever you see one of these functions, if, um, if you're interested in the argument of it along a a, ver a horizontal segment, then it's roughly, usually, bounded by log of the size of the function. So if, if the dear, you have a Dirichlet series that's bounded by t to a power, log of that is the change in argument uh, along that segment. So it would be generally log t, just a principle to keep in mind. Okay, sorry for going over, thank you. <clears throat>
Exactly, exactly. Could use three, something smaller too, but if you go too close to one, you won't get that in inequality that the real part is positive. I mean, you know, by elementary inequalities. something like 20 minutes. So uh, these are the options that we have.